ยินดีต้อนรับสู่สะพานผ่านเทคเกตของพระเจ้า Welcome to Bridges for Mission. Bienvenue au pont pour la mission. Ahla wa sahla fi kon bjusur al arsaliye. Bienvenidos y bienvenidas a Puentes de las Misiones. Hello, everyone. Bridges for Mission. This is Reverend Sandra Dorsonville, one of the co-producers um, and uh, creator of this podcast with Minister Nicole. Hello, everybody. And as you know, this season we are talking about partnership, various levels of partnership, different lenses. How do we come about partnerships? And we have the the pleasure this morning, today, this afternoon, evening for you. Um, to have the executive director for Touch the World, Jesse Cruz, is with us and uh, is sitting at the table. And um, we are so delighted to have you, Jesse, with us. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. So sit tight, everyone, and uh, we are starting. So, Jesse, one of the first questions that we love to ask people is to tell us who you are. So, tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Touch the World. Sure. So my name's Jesse Cruz, and I started working at Touch the World back in 2005. Uh, my wife and I met at Touch the World and got married, and soon after moved to Uganda and led our uh, international branch ministry there for five years. And then while we were there, we were asked to come back, and I was asked to fill the role of executive director. Uh, at that time, there was a transition going on. And so we moved back to the U.S. and became, I became the executive director. My wife uh, runs the curriculum and training piece of what we do and have been here since. And it's been a wild ride. So touch the world uh, in coming back to the U.S. and really uh, re-envisioning what touch the world was. We've always had a very strong focus on training and have always really emphasized the need that when we're sending teams out, they need to have something, uh, a deeper knowledge of why they're going and who they're going to serve and how to serve well. And um, we really look at John 20, 21 as kind of our emphasis for that. And, you know, that just says uh, when Jesus resurrected and he reappeared to the disciples, um, he said, as the father has sent me, I'm now sending you. So really playing off that verse of John 20, 21, we believe that we're uh, called to disciple the next gener generation of youth uh, into service. Um, and then we believe when they go out to serve specifically in this kind of world of missions where we're sending um, students or adults or teams to serve others, right, oftentimes in less fortunate areas, then we come from, which creates, you know, there's an economic disparity there. We want to be able to train them so that they're not doing harm when they go out on their trip. And so we really hold training as kind of the key um, tenant of what Touch the World is and, and what we're about. Because I can see how our two organizations, Touch the World and International Ministries and short-term mission desk especially, really um, can collaborate even more. Um, because we too, like you, believe in preparation. And what COVID has, has taught us is that um, preparation needs to be even more robust because we have to deal with so much, so many of the contingencies, but also that, that cross-cultural piece that you were talking about. So I'm wondering for me, as you were talking, I was really reflecting on what would be the, the definition of partnership that um, Touch the World has and lift up with the young people as they go and serve and be the hands of Christ, the hands and feet of Christ. But um, what's partnership? Yeah, how do you define partnership? What does it look like? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think there's so many aspects to it, right? When you think about the partnership that we have with the churches that we work with, the partnerships that we have with the hosts that we're going to serve, and then the partnership we have with the actual participants, uh, the students or adults going on the trip. Um, I, I think if I were to boil it down and really just give you a real like nugget of what is partnership and define it, um, I think more or less I would say that it would it has to be a mutually beneficial relationship uh, where there's a shared purpose and vision of why you're together and what you're aiming for, what you're doing. 
But I, I think that uh, for us working in missions, there has to be a couple of elements to partnership more than just that definition of saying, um, you know, it has to be mutually beneficial and there has to be a shared purpose and vision. Dealing with people who are different than you, you have to take a step back and you really have to say, um, how am I valuing this other party? Do we have an equal voice in this relationship? But nonetheless, we still need to come to the table and hear each other. Uh, if any of us are parents, uh, you've sat down with your child and you've tried to say, you know, you need to do this. And they say, why? And you say, just because, you know, that's the rule. And it just doesn't fly. It doesn't work. You have to be able to speak to their heart. You have to give them, um, you know, some more, uh, more than just I said so. Uh, there has to be a shared vision, common purpose. There has to be love and value. And so um, when I look at it, I, I think there has to be that collaboration. Uh, I see collaboration as a key word when I think of partnership. You know, what are we here for? How, how are we sharing and being collaborative in our effort? Do we have the same goals? And allowing each party to really speak um, freely. I think what I've seen to be helpful in what we do with our hosts is we understand by nature there's a power dynamic at play, right? We're the ones going, we're the ones uh, paying money, and so we're, we're going to wire money down to that ministry or that, that couple, that, that person that's there on the ground, and they're going to accept our team. And so there's by nature a power dynamic just because we're sending money, number one. What I found is we need to be able to ask first the host, what are your goals, and what we find is oftentimes the host will ask us, well, you know, that that's irrelevant. We want to serve you. What are your goals? And the, the tendency is to just answer them and say, well, this is what our team is looking to do, right? We want to come down. We have this VBS that our church just did, and we would love to just do this VBS. And so what's going to happen in a power dynamic situation of partnership the host partner is going to say, well, I think we can figure that out. There's a couple of churches we could pull together when maybe the reality is they don't want to disappoint you and they don't want to say no because they're afraid that you might actually pull out and go do your VBS program somewhere else because you've stated that that's what's important to you. And so we always press our host to first answer that question because we want to know from, from them, what are you already doing on the ground that needs, needs our help? We will figure out a team that fits what you need. We don't want to come and be an undue burden on you. We don't want to come and just do what we want to do, right? And have it not be valuable for your host community or your uh, relationship that, that you're trying to further with the gospel in, in your context. And so we want to be really cognizant to say, what is that? Um, I think within that, there has to be empathy also. We have to understand um, what are those, what are those values and how are we seeing? So that collaborative effort, the empathy, um, towards each other to say, to defer and to ask that question and allow both to answer and state their values is just absolutely essential. Uh, in preparation for the podcast, I looked up, um, uh, on Barna group did a, did a survey in 2001, just very recently. And they asked this question. They said, what do in ho in field hosts, most desire from an STM team, a short-term mission team. And it was interesting because the top four answers, which I'll read, all dealt with, if you notice, building relationships. So the number one answer was building deeper relationships with the people who support your work or ministry. This is what the hosts are saying, right, of what they desire. Number two, worshiping or praying together, right, with the short-term team coming down. Number three, serving together with people from other parts of the world. And number four, knowing that people value or appreciate the work you're doing. Yeah, so true, so true. Partnership with, but not partnership over. I'm sitting here thinking of all the trips that we plan and all the, the missionary global servants that I work with. And just that reminder of really making sure that they answer that question first of what are you looking for in a team? Because that is so vital for that relationship, for those connections and coming alongside them and working with them and not overshadowing them. So thank you so much for that. So the, over the last two years, it has been interesting and crazy and difficult, but had some beautiful moments come out of it with COVID and just everything that has happened uh, in the last two years. So how has it been for Touch the World during this time? 
Well, like all of us, uh, COVID hit and you're <laughs> thrown into confusion and a little bit of feeling lost in the sense of where are we going? What are we doing? When does this all end? Um, pretty quickly, we came out of that and we've had some really exciting and kind of innovative ideas that we've been working on. And we've heard and seen that many are not doing training which comes back to in the beginning, I said probably about 10% of those two point whatever million going out per year to serve, 10% are being trained. Uh, that's 200,000. So that leaves 1.8 million that are not being trained. And so, you know, when we looked at that and COVID hit, we said, we felt like God was building that dream in our hearts uh, to be a resource provider and to really be kind of on, on the cutting edge of being innovative in that space. And so we started to, you know, create resources that would uh, be able to fill that space where people could get more training and where these 1.8 million plus people that aren't currently getting training could easily find a resource uh, that is plug and play that isn't something um, that's too uh, high end or unapproachable, but you know that they could really engage with. And so, uh, having that comprehensive training was was key for us, and really focusing on that um, became part of our drive. So, one resource that we developed was our training resource manual. Uh, it's a bundle of three resources, and so you have all these different mechanisms or um, you know, ways that you can evangelize, but we find that in storytelling cultures, if you're sharing four points of the gospel that are very doctrine oriented, uh, it doesn't connect right to a story bound culture. And so how do you share the gospel in a story bound culture? And so, you know, part of the training that we provide is how, how do you understand God's story in that story bound understanding? Uh, we believe that every culture can understand story, right? Even, even Western cultures. And so how do you share your story and what God's done in your life? And then how do you connect that back to God and what he's doing? Um, so that's a little bit about what's in the field guides. That's, that's the first booklet. Uh, the second booklet is a devotional journal that's specifically uh, built and written with mission in mind. So challenging um, challenging students to read, you know, gospel stories and then pull out, you know, what does it look like to live on mission or the language we use is to live as a sent one coming out of John 20, 21, as the father sent me, I'm sending you. Um, and so the devotional journal is the second guide in that bundle. And, and the third guide is a re-entry journal, which um, anyone, anyone can understand anyone listening to this podcast right now would, would probably not along with me when I say follow up and reentry is one of the least focused on aspects of a short term mission trip. And so the reentry is essential for our development, our discipleship, the discipleship of uh, the teams that we're taking and the members of our team. Because if we just leave them with the trip, um, they're going to come out with things like, Oh, the, the, the trip, the people were just so beautiful. Uh, the people were so poor, but they were so happy, right? Things like that, that are, that are good observations, but I would, I would posit that they're very surface observations and we can, we can do better. We can go deeper uh, than some of these surface takeaways. And so the field the sorry, the re-entry journal helps people really uh, dive deep and reflect on their experience. There's kind of a cyclical nature um, to uh, re-entry and to learning. And if we don't reflect on our learning, then we're not going to implement anything into our lifestyle. And I think God is calling us to something greater. I think he wants us to have these experiences, serve others, be on mission, see the global world around us, and then use that to spur us on to something greater that he wants to do in both our lives and the lives of his people all around the world. So the second resource we've worked on is called $2 a day and $2 a day is a global poverty simulation. Uh, and we've been using this in our training for years. And we found that it's one of the most practical um, and helpful tools that uh, engages people going on short-term trips with practical thoughts of what it's like to live in poverty. So we have 
uh, people going through the training group up into families living in a fictional community, uh, living on less than $2 a day. And one family might be the carpenter family, the other family, the school teacher, and they all kind of function in the same community. And so they have to relate together, but they also have to make decisions on their own as a family. Like, how do I feed my family today if I only made $2 and, uh, the person that I have to pay rent to is coming around knocking on my door for rent today early, right? Because they need the money for rent and they tell me if I don't pay, I'm going to get kicked out. So do I feed my family or do I pay rent? Uh, and it's questions like those that oftentimes we don't think about when we're going to serve and we don't actually think uh, about people having to make those sorts of life or death uh, decisions that people in poverty are, are making, people in economic poverty. Uh, sometimes every day. And so that's a big piece of our training is helping students really gain empathy towards those that they're going to serve in just simply reframing and understanding situations that maybe they would have never considered. And so we found that to be very, very helpful uh, for a lot of the students that go through our training um, and, you know, are able to then consider what is it like to live in poverty. The third resource and last resource that I'll mention that we've been able to develop is called the Mission Academy. And it's just simply the missionacademy.com or .org. Uh, you know, we talk about it doesn't need you going on a short-term mission trip to live on mission. Uh, God's impetus and mandate for us to live on mission um, is right now. It's the here and now. It's to our neighbors, right? We talk about it in the sense of here, near, and far. The Acts 1-8 model of Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so, you know, what is your here, right? It's your home. Uh, it's the area right around you. What is your near? It's probably around you, but it's the people you wouldn't normally go to. The far is, you know, those people that we're praying for that the gospel would reach uh, that we don't always get to go to that maybe a short term team can go to. But we're called to nonetheless all three spheres. It's not one at the exclusion of another, right? We don't go on a short term trip to check the box and then be excused from reaching out to our neighbors when we get home. No, that, that's actually been the problem with short-term missions. You know, we talk about missions as an everyday, everywhere lifestyle. And so what does it mean to live, live out mission, live as, as God sent one in the here, in the near, and in the far. So that, that's a little bit about what we've been up to. Sorry, that, that's a long answer to a short question, but um, a little bit about you know, our journey through COVID and some of the innovative things that we've been working on. No, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I've heard some of the amazing resources that you guys have been putting together over the last year or so, but it's so great to hear that they're, they're, they, they've come together, that they're finally there, they're out there and for people to use. And I'm really excited to go check some of them out for myself, um, just to also help me when I do trainings with other people and just to have more resources and things. So thank you um, for your, for your quote unquote long answer to a short question. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was wonderful and very helpful. So thank you very much. And thank you for being with us um, on this podcast today. And so to wrap it up, uh, there's one last question we'd like to ask you. And that is in one word, what encouragement would you give to the listeners? Wow. That's, that's tough. I'm, I'm going to say go, uh, but just step out and just go do, do something, start somewhere, join him in what he's doing. Go be sent. Yeah. That's my one word. Thank you so much, Jesse, with the one word, um, love the be sent concept the go, uh, mess it up. God is, God can man, handle it. And, and God is already there, which is oftentimes what people forget. So we're yes. so delighted that you were able to join us. You've gotten a chance a little bit to um, hear what Touch World is all about. You've heard the executive director's uh, passion. Um, so we invite you to, to visit both our, our website. Jesse, this is one more time to, to speak of the website before we close. Touchtheworld.org or the missionacademy.org. Thank you so much. Um, to our listeners, we say until next time. Thank you so much for listening to Bridges for Mission. We are delighted that you joined us. This is a special time for us where we invite you listeners from all over um, to tune in and give us feedback. So you can reach us at volunteers at international 
ministries.org. Also, don't forget to get a hold of the Leader's Guide entitled Short-Term Mission Team Essentials Together on the Journey. It's available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. We thank you again for joining us today, and thank you to all of our subscribers and listeners from all parts of the world. Until next time. Bienvenue au Pont pour la Mission. Welcome to Bridges for Mission. Bienvenidos y bienvenida a Puentes para la Misión. Tu lo mu banasu, tu se de pa, lo da sa kugasago. Yendi ton rap su sapan, pantekit kon prajao. Well, hello everyone from uh, all over the world. Um, you are joining Bridges for Mission, and I'm Reverend Sandra Dorsonville, one of the co-creators of this beautiful podcast that we've had since for two and a half years now, uh, Minister Nicole. This is really exciting. Um, it is, and I can't believe it's already been that long. Yes. Um, so we're we're shifting things as you as you know. Um, and today we are with the beautiful presence of Mrs. Marianne Awaraji. And she will introduce herself in a few moments and um, and say more about her role with SAT7 and what SAT7 is. I know some of you might be saying, are we talking about the final exams in you know the US and high school? No, we're not. Um, but we just ask that you come along and have open hearts, open ears, because what we have to share is is really just beautiful. The conversation with uh, Mrs. Awaraji is going to be a blessing. Um, it has been as we've met her a few months ago and continues to be. So Marianne, welcome, welcome to our podcast. The listeners are ready for you and our conversations. And um, would you mind, as we usually start sharing with the listeners, who you are a little bit and your role at SAT7? Hello, dear friends, and to all the audience who is listening, uh, I am Marianne Awaraji. Um, I work for SET7, and the SET7, um, the mission of SET7 is to provide the churches and Christians of the Middle East and North Africa an opportunity to witness to Jesus Christ through uh, inspirational, informative, and educational television and digital media services. Well, I've been working for SET7 since I was 10. I'm 31 now. Um, I've been serving in children programs. And then when I got married, my husband and I started having a couple counseling program on SET7. And uh, two years ago, I've become the audience relations manager uh, in SET7, which has always been a passion for me to follow up with the viewers, to hear their stories, to share the gospel with them, to pray for them and see their lives changed when they receive Jesus as savior of their lives. Um, what we do as audience relations uh, team, uh, we are about uh, 14 members in Lebanon, Egypt, Jordan, and the North Africa. Uh, we receive messages from the viewers who have been watching our programs or uh, uh, interacting with the messaging campaigns that we run on the 10 various pages we have. Each page, Facebook page, uh, has a specific target audience. We have a page for women to tend to their needs um, and all the taboo topics that women in the Middle East don't dare to talk about uh, we have a page for youth in the middle east who are struggling nowadays with depression and all kind of poisonous um, uh, news on the social media platforms that they hear and listen to every day and different addictions and depression we have a page for kids actually it's a closed group where kids can send us their birthday requests their videos just feel free to talk and express their opinions and be encouraged and empowered by the presenters they grew to love and other pages uh, with a specific target audience. It has been a blessing to just be able to be there for the people who sometimes only want something, someone to care for them, to listen to them with empathy, without judgment, to show them love. 
And then when we add value to their lives and they see the hope we have, they ask us about our faith. And then we share openly about the reason for our hope and our joy, which is Jesus Christ. And our main target is to move them from an online to an offline experience after they watched they have watched our programs whether online or on satellite they have reached out to us they've had they have heard the the gospel message and then we uh, connect with our partners that are on the ground in different regions in the mina region um in different countries in the mina region and then they can have fellowship with the believers whether in underground churches or in real churches near their uh, houses for those who would love maybe to know more about Sat7, they, they can just check the website at 7 usaorg Thank you so much. I I always love hearing what Sat7 is up to and what you guys do because I just find the ministry to be so beautiful and just there's so many different layers to it and it's just, it's wonderful. So I want to dive a little deeper into some of what Sat7 is doing. Um, so our first question for you is what is the latest creative programming efforts happening at Sat7? Um, so as you know, we have the satellite uh, that reaches to so many countries in the MENA regions. Now we have 10 uh, Facebook pages, as I said, to different target audience. We have the YouTube channel, one is for kids, one for the adult Arabic uh, programs, and one for academy, which is educational. We have the VOG, uh, video on demand. It's called Sat7 Plus. It's an application that anyone anywhere can download on his phone um, and then watch any episode of any program whenever they want. And it's really private and so beautifully uh, presented. And now what we're trying to do to reach out to a larger uh, audience and to be able to interact with them because we want to create a dynamic community online is to have live workshops on the Facebook pages. And we found out that it is really, really, um, um, it is really, you know, like beneficial for people because we can have a theologian or an influencer or a counselor go live on Facebook page itself and then talk about an important topic that all the viewers need to hear about. And th this would be like a common need that they would love to hear about. And they start interacting with the presenter or with the counselor, ask their question, and he gets to answer them. The latest one we did was on Sat7 Parents page, Facebook page. Uh, where we tackle uh, issues about, uh, uh, you know, like how to raise uh, godly children, teach the biblical values. And we talked about um, how to help our children in their homework in the midst of all the stress that families in the Middle East are going through with the economic crisis and the frustration they go through. Um, since the start of the school year, many parents were uh, confessing to us that they're abusing their children while studying at home. Um, they were really anxious um, that, you know, like they would curse, beat, uh, hurt their children. And they were so desperate that they were reaching out for help. So we, we thought it was very critical to talk about that. And the child counselor, um, one of the child counselors we work with in Set7 had this workshop and the viewer viewership rate was very high. And even people who participated in that Zoom workshop were so numerous, the ones who were watching, participating, or sending us private messages to know more about this and how they can, you know, like deal with their children and tend to their needs without being frustrated and hurting them. This is one example of the workshops we're uh, launching nowadays. We're going to launch um, different ones on different pages to tackle relationship struggles, youth addictions, and many, many more. That's incredible, meeting the community where they currently are with current issues. I feel like that that's so important because um, I feel like sometimes that gets overlooked. You know, there's, you know, the the agenda and the things that you want to teach from scripture and things like mm -hmm. that, that sometimes you just overlook of what's currently happening um, to really address it and to be able to have those hard conversations because that's not an easy conversation um, or anything for parents to admit that that's what's happening um, mm -hmm. in the homes, but for them to feel um safe to mm -hmm. open up and to share that that's absolutely incredible um so our next question um is what joys and challenges um do you face while innovating in um kingdom building 
Mm. Um, as you were saying, Nicole, I'd like to add something that Jesus used to go, go to the people where they were and talk with them about, you know, like real life examples they were going through, talk about the challenges a farmer faces and then share with them the gospel and he used to feed them or tend to their physical needs and then share with them the good news. And that's what we try to do to, you know, care for our viewers in a holistic way. Uh, add value to their lives and so we will you know like elicit their curiosity to know more about this Christ we so you know passionately talk about and then we share the good news with them uh, the joys of the ministry were well there are many um seeing people lives change is one of the top reasons why I do what I do and I've been doing it for so many years uh to be able to be a light and then reap the harvest and, and see the fruits of, of what we do is such a blessing and it keeps my faith alive sometimes i am down or i'm praying for something and i'm not seeing an answer but then when i see the life of a viewer i've been praying for and following up with change it gives me such a great boost there is one verse that I really love and I keep on remembering uh, to keep on doing what I do. And it says, uh, the Lord will refresh those who refresh others. So while we do the ministry, we are our own faith is really refreshed and encouraged when we see life uh, change, the people of the, the lives of the people we serve change. For example, there is one boy from Syria, he's called um, Rafi. He wrote uh, to us after seeing the life of his best friend change. So he was excited to see why did his life change. And he wrote us on one of our Facebook pages called Daily Bread. And he said, well, my friend Majid told me about you. And I want to really speak to you because I've suffered from depression after the war in Syria. He has, a, you know, like severe depression. He cannot sleep at night. He always hears sounds of bombing. Um, uh, he also had, because of the war, a problem with his eye. He keeps on, you know, asking God, why, why, how can I get out of it? But nothing happens. He asks his grandma to pray for him because he's, she's so godly, but he feels that she's stuck in life. There's nothing he can do about his depression. And he was asking us to pray for him. We started the journey. It's a long journey, you know. We start by praying for the person, sharing, uh, talking about the love of God, um, you know, being the friend he really needs. And we asked him, we sent him the Bible link and asked him to start reading and that we were there to answer all his questions. We had, you know, long conversations for several weeks with this lovely guy. And then um, we prayed for him for healing. And he shared with us once after like two months, he said, um, I cannot thank you, thank you enough. It is the first night where I can sleep peacefully the whole night without hearing any voices or noises. I know uh, that God will forgive me. So I ask his forgiveness for all the sins I have made and I want him to heal me. And I, I believe he will. We hear stories like this story that like Rafi um, every day because we know that the word of God will never return void. And it does miracles. Sometimes you don't do not know or have answers for their problems. But you know that when we share the word of God and when we pray for our viewers, the Holy Spirit is at work. And we are sure that miracles are gonna happen in their lives. Uh, so this is, you know, like the, the thing that makes us joyful the most. Challenges, of course, there are ch challenges in every ministry, and mostly the challenge of having counselors who have the heart for the ministry and who are willing to help us in the audience relations team. You know, it is not easy to follow up on Facebook platforms, Facebook, YouTube, VOD, on satellite, on WhatsApp. It is really challenging and you need people who are willing to invest in their time, be flexible and be willing to hear plenty of struggles and hardships every day and be able to have enough energy to follow up with these people, to pray for him wholeheartedly for them. So the challenge is to find these people, to have resources to hire them, and to make sure they're doing this for the right reasons, to have the heart, as I said, for the ministry, to be able to recharge correctly at the feet of Jesus. Because if we do not, um, if we do not, you know, have encounters with him, to renew our strength, our faith, we have nothing to give. So we need to be fulfilled with him first to be able to give hope to others. Uh, and so we pray that God, you know, like always send these people 
uh, our way, send partners on the ground to be able to give discipleship to the people we start following up with, to send more churches who are willing to take the risk and be there, be the hands and feet of Jesus on the ground for these people. What a rich ministry. Uh, I know our listeners are just, you know, their cup is uh, being filled, hearing all mm -hmm. of what you're giving us. And, and truly, listeners, we're just scratching the surface. Um, but our hearts this morning, Marianne, are just overjoyed. And, mm -hmm. and I love how you speak of partnerships in so multiple ways. Um, because oftentimes, I think when people hear the word partnership or hear it described, they just think it's just a linear process. Um, mm -hmm. And Jesus was such a, a beautiful craftsman at partnership and meeting people where they are, mm -hmm. um, finding their hearts and just pouring into them. So, uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know this is a conversation. It's a beginning, um, but we also want to give you time to, to ask us questions if you have any before we close our, our episode for today. Well, I love what you do and I love your passion for what you do and how when we start something, no matter how small it is, but we have the heart for the ministry and the passion to do God's work. He sends the resources. He makes us see fruits for what we do. And I see that in you too, Sandra and Nicole. So God bless you for what you do. I love it. And I would like to ask you, what is one goal that you pray and hope to achieve in this coming year through your ministry? Oh, that's a that's a beautiful question. And I'll take that one, Nicole, if that's okay. Um, um, what I really, the goal, I mean, there are multiple goals, but one that I would say is, um, and you mentioned it earlier, I would really love to see much more of a dynamic community that is passionate about short-term uh, mission alive on social media. I mean, mm -hmm. we've been uh, doing this episode now for two and a half years, and it would be so wonderful to have conversations with listeners and just to hear more of those seeds that we've been planting. Um, what is it like? What has it been growing? What has it been nurturing for some of our listeners? And and perhaps where, where they'd like us to go um, and develop and hear about ministry because we know God's mission is alive. So it's to really have that greater um, partnership and, you know, community, social media presence. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Beautiful. Beautiful. Now, Nicole, um, what is one story uh, one of your listeners shared with you and that has impacted you deeply? Oh, goodness. There are so many wonderful stories we have heard on the podcast over the last few years, but I think one of them, um, that has really stuck with me is I do a lot of work with young adults, um, high school and slightly older college. Um, and especially now with the emerging leaders program through I am, but, um, very early on pre the emerging leader program, we did an interview with two missionary kids and, um, in there, her and Sandra get talking about horses. Um, and it's a great conversation. You should go listen to it. Um, but they start talking about horses and how they um, were introduced to the technique of riding a horse. And they go through the process of, you know, bareback and then a pad and then the reins, and then they get the harness. And it's this whole process of developing small parts of you step by step. Um, to be able to be a strong rider, to be a healthy rider with your horse, um, and to feel that relationship between you and this beautiful creature. And in that conversation, um, the missionary kid turns it almost in a dime and says, it's very much like your faith, that you have to develop it piece by piece by piece for it to be strong and to be healthy and to grow. But ultimately it comes down to that inner relationship between you and God. And that everything else is just a tool to help with that relationship, but it's not the relationship itself. And I think that that's just such a beautiful example of just the intimacy that you can have with God, um, no matter what stage of life you have, no matter what tools are at your fingertips, no matter what is around you, that ultimately that relationship between you and the creator is yours. Um, and nobody can change that. And just the tools that just keep getting added to it over the, over your life. It's just something that comes and goes and things change and things adapt and, um, and you just move with it and you just go with it. And I think it's just such a beautiful reminder of just, um, kind of 
peeling back all the layers of society and what people expect with you and your faith and your faith journey, but just what is really at the core of your relationship with God. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you for the question. So, um, Marianne, mm -hmm. thank you for your presence. Thank you for being with our listeners today. Um, we ask that you just give us one last word of encouragement, um, mm -hmm. not just to Nicole and myself, but to to the globe. The globe is yeah. at our um, is a near shot. It really is close. So, um, mm -hmm. give us that word. Yeah. Well, what's really on my heart is to encourage every person listening, no matter how old he is, that he is effective uh, in the kingdom of God. Never say I'm old now, there's nothing for me to do, or I'm too young. Let's be part of a community. Let's um, get to know what uh, Christian uh, communities are around us. We're all part of one body, and collaboration among members of the body of Christ is vital because it reflects the, the, the real nature of God and how he designed the body to function. So it is beautiful just to commit to uh, getting to know other organizations around me, how they're serving God, be part of, you know, like encouraging, praying for them, supporting them in any different way, because we really need each other. It's, it refreshes my heart to hear stories, you know, like uh, from the fruits of your ministry, and I'm sure you do the same. So let's really get to know each other, pray for each other and support um, however we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, listeners, you have been, I know your cup has been filled and overflowing. So until next time. Bienvenidos y bienvenida a Puentes para la Misión. No, no, no. Welcome to Bridges for Mission. Bienvenue au Pont pour la Mission. Good morning, Bridges for a Mission. This is Reverend Sandra Dorsonville, and it is, I am so excited to be. Um, with you this morning because I have special guests. I want to welcome you to a special episode of our podcast. And as you know, Bridges for Mission focuses on cross-cultural short-term mission. We are a podcast sponsored and facilitated from international ministries. And today I have the humble honor to be with colleagues and brothers and sisters from Liberia and from um, Virginia, actually. So we are multi-state, multi-country. You will hear voices from the Lot Carey Baptist Mission School in Liberia, and you will hear voice from also um, a dear sister in Christ who traveled with us recently when we did a short-term mission trip to visit partners that International Ministries has in Liberia. So one of them, one of those partners is the Lot Carey Baptist Mission School. And um, it was just an amazing trip. And you will hopefully through this episode, get a sense of what it is, what it was all about. Um, with us is the principal, um, Dr. Reverend Dr. Emile Sampil mm -hmm. and his colleagues, his staff, he will introduce them. And then um, we will also hear from Dr. Belinda Davis, uh, who's a social worker who um, participated and was a team member, part of the team um, who came with us. So Dr. Sampil, Brother Sampil, it is so good to be with you this morning. Um, I feel like I'm right there. Um, mm, you certainly are. Oh, thank you, thank you. So welcome to our special episode with Bridges for Mission. And I turn the mic to you to introduce the colleagues that you have with you. And then um, um, and then we'll take it from there with our first question and then the flow with that. So why don't you introduce why don't you introduce the, the colleagues to the listeners that we have? Okay. Thank you, Reverend Sandra Dozenville, for inviting us to 
be a part of this podcast. Uh, we are excited um, to be a part of it. And we hope uh, through this medium, um, folks will get to know a little bit more about us and what we do. Uh, I'm um, Emil Sampil, um, Superintendent Principal of the Lakira Baptist Mission School. And here with me to participate on this podcast is our Vice Principal for Instruction, Joel Sandy, and our Vice Principal for Student Affairs, Ms. Kimberly Anna. Wonderful, welcome, welcome both. Um, I We give virtual hugs. So Brother Sampio, can you, in your words, as you've been in that role at the school and um, involved with various global partners and church partners, the meaning of partnership? Um, for me, part partnership is um, bringing gifts together. Uh, I bring my gifts, you bring your gifts, and we use those gifts to enable, we use those gifts to empower, we use those gifts to support, we use those gifts to encourage each other in ministry. Um, uh, during the partnership, we it's a mutually beneficial program. Um, the giving and the receiving, um, both both parties enjoy receiving. One person might be giving something physical, but in return receiving something spiritual or something emotional. So a partnership is a is a unique relationship between two or more partners um, bringing their gifts to the table to share uh, with each other. Wonderful. Let's hear more from uh, Brother Sandy and Sister Kimberly and as far as in light of what you've described with the partnerships, how, um, Brother Sandy, how have you seen the benefits of hosting volunteers at the school? Okay, ma'am. Uh, firstly, let's see um, hosting volunteers as also part of ministry. And in the words of Titwell, he says, ministry is doing something that is helpful and needful. Uh, looking at that, volunteers will bring a different aspect to, to the field in the sense that they will be benefiting, like Reverend Sandy talking about partnership, the volunteers and both the recipient, you know, partners will benefit a whole lot. Now, exposure has to do with it's, the exposure is necessary for education. Now, uh, if I get exposed to a thing, you know, I do it differently. All right, I can, I mean, know a particular thing in my cultural context, but looking at it from another cultural context gave me a better look at things and know how to handle issues outside of my context. Hosting volunteers will enable both the students to learn from the volunteers as well as the student, as the volunteers learning from the students as well. Wonderful. And the school has, um, you have from little people, kindergartners, right? Um, yeah. All the way to 12th grade. I remember that we we were privileged to, um, to witness the rehearsal of kindergartners graduation, which brought mm -hmm. a lot of joy to our hearts. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see, do you have volunteers um, hosting in classrooms or is it more administrative? Both ways, both classroom and administrative areas. There's a whole lot to learn from each other every time we collaborate. Collaboration bring education itself. You know, because when I, I list with you or some other person, he or she brings something to the table and I bring something to the table as well. Um, the gospel message will remain the same, but the meta can change. We will be learning from each other different methods of how to handle both the classroom and administrative duties. So we both want to learn both ways and the need in both areas. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I know well, you have various campaigns, health related campaigns or uh, reading campaigns that you do with the schools. Sister Kimberly, is there a special health awareness campaign that you'd like to share with our, our listeners? Yes. So currently at Locaria, we have this special health awareness campaign, which has to do with menstrual hygiene. And this has been really beneficiary and it has been helpful for our students. And uh, this program has brought about uh, transformation in attendance, especially for the girls. And some of the testimonies you hear from them, they'd be like, okay, usually during the month when I'm screening, I have a heavy flow. And um, now since I'm here at Locary, we're in, I receive sanitary pads and I can even change my own these as well and be able to stay in school. So they see that as something good. And this is something I also like to share about our, our health awareness program, which has to do with the menstrual hygiene. And very simply, is not even aware that this is something that is also benefiting the community. Uh, a week ago, we had students from other schools here on campus and we were writing their national exams. And the first person came to me asking if I would assist them with, with, with PAD because they, they, they were only a period. And I gave her the PAD. Imagine if we did not have such program, that child would have been so embarrassed for that day or possibly she would have had to leave the examination hall to go home and get that. And it will shock you to know that all through that week, I had to supply the girls there. So this 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 program is is something so unique that like here can run because of the partnership that we have. And it's something that we hope that it can extend from Lakiri to our community because Liberia really need this. And since it has been able to help our attendance at school, especially for the girls, we really hope that this can help the girls in Liberia as a whole to be able to stay in school. What an amazing health awareness that you have undertaken. How did that come about? Um, maybe either yourself or whether or Brother Sam Peel to answer that question, because it is very forward thinking to support um, the young girls and to also keep attendance um, every month and not impact education. But we, about 12 years ago, we realized that um, certain time of the month, um, there was a lot of absent, absenteeism uh, among our girls. And we did a survey and found out uh, when they were on their menses, they stayed home from school. Uh, and some of them stayed home because one, they didn't have the proper equipment. And, and so we started thinking, how can we help? And that's how we started this program with uh, providing free sanitary supplies to our girls. And immediately we started that, um, attendance uh, jumped. Um, they stayed in school because they had the proper equipment. And because they had the proper equipment, that also minimized infections. Because without the proper e equipment, they were um, susceptible to infections because we're using stuff that were not really sanitary and safe. Yeah. So we, we solved um, multiple problems. One, attendance jumped, um, infections were minimized, self-confidence was built up. They didn't have to be shy anymore. You know, they could be confident because they were properly equipped to handle whatever they were dealing with without everybody else knowing what was going on with them. Yeah. So um, several things happened when we initiated that and that has continued um, to, to boost attendance. It has continued to boost um, confidence of our girls. And they probably tell um, students from other schools, mm -hmm. um, this is one of the reasons why I like to come to Lakiri because of this program. You don't have that at your school. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And I think it also um, let's invite 
uh, Dr. Belinda Davis, because I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Sister Belinda, your the church that you're a member of, uh, Alfred Street Baptist Church, has been a partner to support um, the sanitary pads for these yeah. young ladies. Yeah. Uh, so do you want yeah. to share with us, Sister <clears throat> Belinda, a little bit more about um, that partnership and then um, what would you take back to now that you visited, now that you have seen, as the, you know, the good book says, come mm -hmm. and see um, and be the witnesses. So tell us more. Absolutely, Reverend Sandra. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much. And I just really want to extend my heartfelt thanks for to Dr. Uh, Sam Peel and Brother Sandy and Sister Kimberly Anna, who hosted us so graciously when we went to visit. And I will certainly take back with me as a member of Alfred Street, I will highlight the wonderful work of Lot Carey and the many, many ways that they support the students at their school. And it's such a holistic way that we heard them talking about. So not only are the students prepared academically to be citizens of the world through the excellent um, and well-trained teachers, but also uh, just the social and emotional care of the students that we were witness to when we had the opportunity to see the kindergarten um, graduation and the interactions with their teachers and just how joyful the students were. And that truly is a mark of um, wonderful childhood experiences when you feel the joy of the children, which we were able to do. Um, also, um, we've just heard how they are supporting the students emotionally and socially through um, providing menstrual uh, products to girls, but it's also my understanding that through that, that awareness and that provision, they're also educating um, male students too in terms of um, appropriate hygiene and just sort of demystifying uh, demystifying that. I think also uh, Dr. Van Peel shared with us that the school often serves children before and after school. Uh, many of the children apparently have other responsibilities in the home. And the school also just provides a place for them to be children. And it was also inspiring to hear Dr. Peel's vision for um, the school having sports camps and, and programs during the summer for school for children to again uh, maintain that connection. So I'll be taking all of that back um, with me to Alfred Street. And I'm very excited because the timing is perfect. Um, our minister of missions uh, who also oversees the senior ministry of which I'm a member. We're having a, uh, a gathering tomorrow and I really look forward to speaking with her and sharing with her all the wonderful things that I had the opportunity to see and experience at Lot Carey um, Baptist Mission School. And so I'm hoping that we can further that partnership. I can certainly tell them about the benefits I, of what we're already doing but also ways to expand the partnership. It would be wonderful if, for example, we could have you know, mission teams to come and do an exchange, maybe even of students and hosting students and faculty. And so the possibilities to me are endless. And so that's why I um, welcome the opportunity to take those messages back to strengthen the partnership. So can you tell the listeners of, um, again, when you will be, because the podcast is gonna be aired uh, most likely after you've had the meeting with your mission um, committee at Alfred Street Baptist Church. So mm -hmm. just for just for reference, um, when is that happening? Oh, it's tomorrow, um, June 14th. Um, from 11 to 3 is the gathering, and I look forward to speaking with the Minister of Missions at that time. Wonderful. Well, listeners, um, it has been such a delight to be able through technology and um, to be in Liberia, to be in multiple states this morning and here and just receive a little bit of a, what is happening um, cross-culturally, what is happening with one of our partners um, and to have that invitation to come alongside if you feel that nudge to, to wanna hear more. Um, so we were with the lot carry, um, Baptist Mission and, um, in Liberia. And um, 
I am Reverend Sandra Dorsonville, one of the co-founders of this podcast, Bridges for Mission. And you can find about find out about us by emailing us at volunteers at internationalministries.org. So, Brother Sempiel, if um, any of our listeners, because you know, they listen from really all over the world, from um Zimbabwe, Hungary. Um, Indonesia, we truly have about close to 5,000 followers. But if any of them were curious about um, the school or how to how to support, maybe how to come and, and volunteer, what would be the best way to um, to contact the school and so that they can do some have some conversation? Is there an email address that you feel safe giving um, to our listeners? Yes, um, the email address is um, Emil Sampeel, E M I L E S A M P E A L at gmail.com. And Thank once you send that email, we'll, we'll respond. Wonderful, wonderful. So, listeners, I know you are excited, um, as I am, and um, it was a delight to be with our guests this morning. And until next time. Misenai Spoyeni. Yokoso Bridges for Mission. Bienvenue nan pon pour mission. Welcome to Bridges for Mission. Welkom bij Brugge voor Zending. Hi guys, welcome to my channel. Oh wait, no. Hi guys, welcome to Bridges for Mission featuring ELC. some meetings with the connectors as well which was really awesome um, but to be together in person um, for the first time uh, as like a whole group is really really amazing um, and it's been quite an experience so far uh, yeah, yeah I just was, does anyone have anything in particular they wanted to say about that um, how that feels for you yeah. it's really interesting because we've met each other in like different um, combinations so we'll like meet with the whole group maybe like twice I think we met on zoom but then we've met as like trailblazers for uh, a different meeting and then um, 
our Trailblazer cohort has met like a ton of times. Shout out to Sarah, Trey, and Adrian. We miss you. We miss you. Um, and yeah, and then the Urbana thing. So we have like these different combinations, but most everything has been online. So it's really surreal to like meet everyone in person, like, and just see the whole of them. <laughs> like, I can see your legs. Yeah, <laughs> and the back of your head. Like, and your like, head goes all the way around. Yeah, <laughs> and so it's it was very interesting, especially at the beginning, at the very beginning when we met each other, because you have this like dynamic of I know you, but I don't really know you. And like we've been connecting on one level, but now we can like, yeah, just interact. We can see each other's hand motions. <laughs> um, and yeah, just how people move about in the world. And so at the beginning it was, we were talking about this um, with Naomi, we were saying like how at the beginning it was very like awkward because we didn't know how to like bridge that gap of coming from online to in person. But once we did, I think we gelled really well, so. Yeah, I think my experience has just been really different from all of yours because my cohort was just me and Ruthie. And I don't know, I felt a bit like an outsider with all of you guys because it was just the two of us. And we didn't meet as often with our possible projects. We just kind of texted about it, like, hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Great. So how's the project? Good. Like that was our entire conversation with the gospel project. Um, so I definitely felt like an outsider coming into this, and I was really worried about what it was going to be like. Uh, especially after you guys, some of you went to Urbana together, it really seemed like you were like super tight and clicky, and I wasn't sure how I was going to fit into that. But then got here and like started hanging out with you guys, and that was not at all how it was. It was just kind of you're part of the team. You've always been a part of the team there's no difference between how much time you have or have not been with us in person. So it's been, it's honestly just been like reuniting the family. Can we also talk about the strange connections that we all have with <laughs> <Yeah>. each other? <laughs> I was just about to say that. It's yeah, weird. That's true. It's so weird. Yeah, well, because, like, Alex and I both went to, like, the same, like, summer camp as, like, children, and Sarah, or no, sorry, not Sarah, I don't know why I said Sarah, Alex knows um, my father and grandparents um, really, and well. really, really well. <laughs> um, and we were talking about it like while we were doing some service and she was just like, wait, you're whose grandchild? Tony and Mary, what? <laughs> yeah, so that was really weird. Well, there was that one. And then the night before in the bathroom, <laughs> I had been talking to Nora, just kind of sharing like, bit of my history and you know how I got to where I was and whatnot and then Naomi and Anna came in and they said something about Camp Cowan and I was just like hold up Camp Cowan and they were like yeah we've been like not sure how to talk about this with you but our cousin just married your ex-boyfriend <laughs> Personalities of everyone 
and like getting to know each other more on a personal level just know like how are you doing good i'm great whatever no like we can like feel our joy we can like celebrate for example alex passing her medical test <laughs> relationship family <laughs> yeah i really love like the deep conversations that we had like i was afraid they were gonna be a bit superficial because it was the first time we were seeing all each other but to know that we have more in common than we think it's been really beautiful and also to see how we have different personalities, but they all mesh in a way. So it's been pretty great seeing how we work well together, the conversations, even when we're about to sleep, like it's been all clicking. And so I can see God literally every day, all the time. So yeah. And it's really like a blessing. Like I haven't really noticed a lot of, or really any like, interpersonal issues between any of us and like I have been a part of so many different teams and so many different groups and that is not always the case like it's super like special that like we're able to have this and it just kind of speaks to like the fact that like we were meant to be here together it's like it flows even when we're doing like uh, the outside work mm. and we're like okay Let's pair in groups and then, okay, we finish, we call the other group and they do what's missing and it's like, it flows and we're even taking care of each other. Nicole is our mom here, but Alex is like our auntie, but our young aunt because she's like, have you drink water? Are you okay? How are you feeling? Is the sun bothering you? Like, have you put on sunscreen? Did you retouch your sunscreen? So, we're like taking care of each other. Yeah, it's like we're we're able to put like we're putting effort into each other like we're investing in each other and it's it's like with the zooms like we could be like oh I forgot about the zoom and then I just get on the zoom and then like okay the zoom's done but like now it's like we we got to know each other and like we like want to know like we want to know each other more and like, we're asking each other, like, how are you doing? Have you had enough water? Um, because we care, and, yeah. yeah. You can really feel the love. Like, I mean, it's only been, like, three days, but even yesterday we were already, like, this is family, like, in a good way. <laughs> yeah, kind of like what you said, Naomi. It's like, when you're on Zoom, it's like you're on Zoom, but you're thinking about your test that's the next day, and you're looking around because your roommate's walking around behind you, or your cat jumps all over your computer, or <laughs> whatever happens, and you're just looking at the clock, and you're like, okay, this is fun, like, bye, like, that's it for the meeting. But, like, I went to Urbana, and I noticed, like, after, I would be, like, more inclined to be like, oh, like, Nora, how's this? Like, how's this going? Or, oh, Kaylee, because, like, I've seen them in person, and it's just a different bond. So, like, being able to, like, be here and spend all that time with you, like, in person with no other distractions. Like, none of us are sitting here like, oh, we have a test in 20 minutes, like, gotta go. It's like, this is what we're doing. This is the only thing we're doing. So you can really, like, dedicate your full attention to, like, meeting each other and intentionally, like, knowing each other, which I think, I think that'll change the way our meetings are forever now. Like, I feel like it'll change it in a good way too. Like I feel like now we're all gonna be like excited. We're gonna know when those meetings are. We're gonna wanna log on. We're gonna wanna count down the days till the next trip because me and Nora did that after Urbana. We were counting down the days till this. So like, yeah, I think it'll just be good for all of us to like really be like connected better. Cause also like on Zoom, you're in a group, like a big group and it's only like one person talking. Cause on Zoom, if you talk, like together it, it does not work at yeah. all but here like we're just like walking places or in the car ride and you can just get to know people one-on-one -on -one in a way that really isn't possible in zoom like even if you have breakout rooms like it's different yeah. it is different so very thankful no but same it's um you too yeah no i've been stretching every morning i've been yeah. doing some yoga actually this morning i did cardio that's why i was like super sweaty and like nasty i had to like leave the room because i was just like I see, I'm dying. Um, but yeah.
but it felt like really good. It feels good to, to stretch in the morning. I feel more um, alive. And that is something we can do together too. Like on Zoom, you're not going to do yoga together. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I also feel like there's something really bonding about getting really hot and sweaty and filthy together and just being like, I'm drowning in my own sweat. I see that you are also drowning in your own sweat. Let's drink some water together and we can commiserate. And, but also like enjoy the moment together. Because I feel like despite the fact that we were all hot and sweaty and tired, really quite gross, nobody was miserable. Yeah. It was just like, this is good. Like we have done something good with our bodies and we've done it together and we've seen the progress we've made. We've seen the impact that we've made. And you know, it was just a really positive experience. Is that, for example, yesterday, obviously the group that went outside was a smaller group, so we missed like the other participants. Mm -hmm. But we like gave it our all, like if we were a big group, like if the ones that were not there would be with us, that's like also the energy that we were gonna do, and we wanted to give it our best to finish the whole house, and. It had like I have felt so much gratitude and happiness because even I was sweating my eyelids off because I don't know what happened. I needed a squeegee for my eyes. Um, the lady was like so kind, and she even when we got here, she added me on Facebook and she wrote like a message on Facebook with our pictures of how grateful she was and everything. So that was like wow, we're doing like. God's work, and we're doing it together, and by doing it together, we are like showing more presence of Him to others, so I felt so much joy for that. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but no matter the situation or the process, we have never been alone. Even though it's one person who's beside you, like, you're there with the person, so I think that it's very special that no matter what, you're not gonna be alone, and that's how God is with you and us. Yeah. So, he's been here all the time. Yeah. Going off of that, um, Juliana and yesterday, both of us were woke up in the early hours of the morning, Amen. throwing up, <laughs> and um, I remember at the one point I was, I was in the bathroom, I had just thrown up, and I was like, oh my goodness, Lord, this is unbearable. I don't know what I'm going to do. And Juliana walks in and is like, are you okay? And I look at her with this, like, pained look on my face, and she's like, are you throwing up too? And I was just like, oh my goodness, I'm not alone. <laughs> and, and it was just, it was it was terrible. We were like, it was not fun. We were sick, but um, our Nicole and Alex, like, helped us, like, get settled in a different room with cots and we were just laying in there like trying to sleep we had to like get some electrolytes in us so it was it was a bonding moment and it was we were not alone yeah. <laughs> bonding is a team yes. <laughs> we were literally yeah. in sickness and in health <laughs> <laughs> you curl together you curl together yeah. <laughs> we're driving and throwing up together that's our motto we were but it's like I think one thing that we have done very well is to communicate. If we're not feeling well, if how we're feeling, if we're like having a hard time, even how we felt before, and they coming to Puerto Rico, um, we have communicated how we have felt. So that's something that we have been like a support system for each other. So I would recommend always speaking with the people that you're on your trip or with about your feelings and making them clear and how you feel and that will be a successful trip also. Because yeah, part of that is also like checking in with each other, right? And when you check in with each other, the other person like reciprocates that and really opens up uh, to you. So I think it's really like a two-way street of communication but also seeking out that communication. I really got a sense of like the um, group cohesion. Uh, yesterday morning, um, when one of our people was like sharing um, part of their like testimony, it was just like 
was very um, difficult for me um, because it like invoked a lot of um, emotions and feelings that I had um, for a long time just been pushing down. Um, and I got the sense that that was kind of like, that needed, that share allowed me to express those feelings that I was ignoring. Um, and I just had to trust myself and trust God to be like, okay, I need to reach out to someone like right now because I cannot process these feelings alone. Um, and so I like reached out, got a hug, and like as I like broke down and cried, like there were other like members of the ELC who like sat with me and just like comforted me as I like processed my emotions. And then like afterwards there were like, you know, other people also like were just like, hey, are you okay? And it was just like, yeah, I'm okay. I'm, I'm feeling a lot better. Like it feels really good to cry. Um, and we were, that was like our what, first full, second full day together. So like super early on, um, probably wouldn't have been able to do that with a bunch of strangers. So we were definitely meant to, to work together. And I'm super grateful for all the folks who have supported me. Yeah, it's crazy how like, like this is our third full day, right? And it feels like we've been here and like we've started building these relationships for like a long time but at the same time like it's going fast so it's just crazy how like we're like it's only been like three days but like we've like gotten to know each other so much more and have like built upon these relationships and i've grown so close together in just three days and we still have like for a lot of us like three more days so I, it's just so cool to see like how like how much closer we can get um to so. and i think it's i've seen everyone be like intentional about reaching out to each other like we've said before but even group members who aren't in person right now we've tried to be intentional about reaching out to them and letting them know that we're still thinking about them. Yeah, and I think a mission trip is a very hard and vulnerable time. I think people who don't do mission work see it as like these people are going on a vacation right now and I, I that's not what it's like, honestly. Um, and you see things you've never seen before and you do activities you've never done before and you're just in this place that's normally far from your home and just different and it can be just a hard and vulnerable time and you try to talk about topics that people normally stray away from and I think like if you don't have that good community like that's your last mission trip you're not coming back if you don't have a good community like you need people who are going to lift you up and like that's something I noticed about this team too like we've talked about some hard stuff this week and we've seen some hard stuff this week but like there's always somebody there like when you turn around with t uh, like tears running down your face there's somebody there going like hey but it's okay and they might let you sit there and cry for a couple minutes but then they're going to be hyping you up a couple minutes later and singing a song with you and you're just going to be like feeling better but like if you don't have that community like there's like nothing so like it's really good that like we have that community right away and i think we were able to all like connect and identify with each other's needs even if they were unspoken so like when we felt that somebody was in that like time of need, we were able to like fill ourselves in and then when roles were reversed, everyone would do it for us too. And it's really interesting because that ties back to like all of the Zoom times we've had and trust that we've started building. Like Josh Quinn and I like went into it the first night. Like <laughs> we went to some <laughs> deep places in our conversation. In the and, ice cream shop. shop. Yeah, in yeah. the ice cream shop. So while people were learning sign language, we were like, mm. <laughs> 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 like digging deep. What are the ethics? Um, of? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like what is life? I don't know. Anyway. Um, yeah, so it's cool that we have that trust built already but also with people that we haven't been like as consistently on Zoom that we're still able to go to those deep places. So yeah, it's been a blessing. And this is just a group that makes you feel comfortable. Because I mean, I, I, it, but I came in with like, I don't, I felt very protected of myself and very insecure. Um, and like, I think it took maybe an hour 
And I was like, oh no, I can trust these people. Uh, it's okay. Like, nice. y'all are people I can hang out with and I can share my feelings with and like trust that you are going to say what's helpful to me and, you know, demonstrating that love um, and just, you know, being an encouragement and being like a family um, with everybody that's here. And I feel like that'll extend to like when we go home now too. Like I feel like the bond we formed here is like real and genuine and like mm -hmm. I know like after Urbana like I really kept up with like the people who went. Like we would keep texting, we would keep talking and things like that. So I feel like that's something like we'll have when we go home too. Like before we met in person, like it would be awkward for me to just text somebody and be like, Hey, how was your day today? What you doing this week? Like it's really weird because you're like, I know this person but I don't, like like you said earlier Nora. But like now I feel like I could easily text someone and be like, hey, we had like a 45 minute conversation about how you like to like do whatever, like how has that been? Like, and it's like so much more normal and natural, but also if I need something, like I feel like I could reach out and be like, hey, I need to confide in someone. And then like, there's this whole circle of people here that I can do that with. I'm very impressed by the maturity of this group and the love and care that you show for each other and just your high level of integrity, decency, and the love that you showed for the people that you work for here. It's a very, very special group of people. You're somewhat younger than my children by just a few years, and uh, it's really encouraging because I don't get to spend a lot of time with younger Americans because I don't live there. So I'm just really optimistic about the future of the world and the United States if there are more folks like yourself in it. But I've really been privileged to be part of the group, and just, you're really sweet people. Even doing each other's hair, and just the way you took care of each other when you were ill, and the level of conversation has been very high. So that's been enjoyable. This is, I mean, this is a great group. This is, um, like being in the U.S. for three years and not, be, not being able to, like, the, it's just the kids in my, in my grade, they're, they're part of a generation that just doesn't know how to socialize because they're constantly on their phones. They don't know how to have genuine deep conversations. But this group really does know how to do that. So that's why it's a really special group of people. One more thing to say about the group to go back to you, Will, was the way that you included the other Kayla and other people. So it isn't just about you. You were able to include other people that weren't part of your group. And so that's also real nice. <laughs> Going off of what Rick said, like I I feel like our group, as much as we feel like close and like a family, we're not like an exclusive group. Mm. And even within our group, there I don't feel like we have like clicks like you haven't had in school but like we might be like okay have this conversation with this person and then have a conversation with this person and our, our groups that we talk with even conversationally like change and I, I just think that's really neat that we're able to do that um, and we feel safe with everyone in our group and yeah like you said able to include other people the analogy that just came to my mind is the amoeba, which is like a gelatinous microscopic <laughs> organism. But like, we're kind of like that because we are cohesive as a group and everybody is serving in a role that works together for the same goal. But as bits and pieces break off from us or join into the group, our dynamic doesn't change. We still stay oriented towards the same goal. We still stay united as a group, uh, welcoming or you know, sending people off to do whatever it is that they have to do. What I think is really special is, like, when Nora came up to me and started asking me about, like, my, my life, everything, like, about Chile and stuff, um, and how we really got, became quick friends very fast. And that just, that just doesn't happen with a lot of people. I give a, uh, a shout out, actually, to um, Nicole Cox. Um, mm -hmm. Woo! Obviously, being our leader on this trip, but also 
all of the preparation that she has been doing the past year to kind of set up for this. Like, mm -hmm. I see that. Like, you know, all the personality tests we did, all of the, like, Zoom meetings we did. Like, I don't know if she realized that she was, like, helping to, like, plant the seeds for our group to be successful, but she really was. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we got to, you know, we got to give her credit and, you know, praise God as well for that, that, like, we were the people um, that were chosen for this and that were able to come to this. Um, and it's just really awesome to share this space with all of you. And like Adriana said, um, Nicole is like her mom, and she's always like, she's always making sure we're okay. She's always like trying to take care of us. And even if that means um, she realized she brought 30 SPF sunscreen and got <laughs> sunburned and probably some poisoning, but she <laughs> you better make that in. Um, even when she looks like a lobster. Whatever like lobster. Shout out to Mr. Crab. It matches, the, the, lovely lovely Mr. Crab. <laughs> it matches the lovely turquoise green hair. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, I do. So we love her. Thank yeah. you. And she's she's led by example, like mm -hmm. being an example to us, not just by what she says, by how she is towards us. And sometimes when, like, sometimes. We think it's getting annoying when she's like, are you okay? Like, are you okay? Are you good? Have you drinking enough water? But really, it shows us, like, how to care for others. And it, it's, um, yeah, she's being an example to us and teaching us how we, like, what we should be like and what we want to be like. And, yeah. and how to laugh at ourselves. Yes. <laughs> when yes. people are lovingly making fun of us, she has shown how to be humble and accept a that. A great sport. Yeah. And besides doing a really good job, you really are a good person. Yeah. You just know yes. that. We love you. Yeah. We love you. <laughs> and she's a chicken person. Yes. We stand chicken. Is the goal to make me cry on the podcast? I just said it. This is supposed to be about you guys, not me. Speech, speech. We call appreciation post. <laughs> No, I mean, truly, honestly, it's, I am going to start crying, but it's fine. I'll cry off the podcast. It's fine. Um, no, it, the last couple of days have been a lot because, you know, there's all of you and the personalities and the heat and making sure you're not getting hurt on the work side. And then also like the tropical storm was coming through and people were like, it's going to do this and versus this. And I'm like, do I keep them here? Do I make them go home? I don't want them to go home. So there's been a lot of logistical things going on. But um, I was sitting in the van last night, listening in the like the bottom corner of the van, but don't tell people. But I was sitting in the van last night. And <laughs> It's fine. Go it's away. fine. Anyway, I was sitting in the van, probably buckled up, and <laughs> I was listening to the conversations. And like in one spot, I was hearing people share testimonies, and another, I was hearing people share advice about life. And in like another part of the end, like they were just laughing and having a fantastic and time <laughs> and singing Veggie Tales, House, of course. And it was in that moment last night, sitting in the van. Like I even texted Jenny, who's our assistant leader, and I texted her, and I was like. I wish you could hear the conversation that is happening in the van right now because it is the most heartwarming and soul feeling like thing I've, I've heard in a very long time because I don't have to force you guys to have those conversations with each other. I don't have to say, go share your testimony or go like the older kids, you know, give advice to the younger or the younger to the older. Like, I don't have to do any of that. Like, it's just like you've all said, it is a natural cohesion of everyone. And as like one of the leaders, it makes me feel so good that it's like after all the work and all the stress and all the logistics and all the things that it's just, it's working and that I don't have to worry about that part of it. I can worry about the logistics, but I don't have to worry on if you're going to take care of yourself, even though I'm like, take care of each other, like let me know something's going on. Like I know when I say it, you'll actually do it. 
Like, I don't have to be texting every five seconds. Are you guys drinking water? Are you okay? Because then I get pictures of people drinking water and I'm like, we're all okay. So like, it is, it's so good to hear these conversations and to see the things happening. And it's just like, I'm so honored and so blessed just to be a part of it. And like, it's weird to think that I'm like the leader of this like amazing group because like you all, like each and every single one of you are just absolutely fantastic. And I'm so proud of all of you guys. And we've had so much amazing news this week and just like tears and laughter. And it's just, I like, I can't ask for anything else. Like truly I have the best job in the world because I get to spend a week in Puerto Rico with you guys and then turn around and in a couple months get to do a different trip with you guys. So like, it's just absolutely fantastic. So I'm going to go have a little, little tears right now, but I love you guys so much. <laughs> if you're at home listening to this podcast and you even think you want to do something like this, even the slightest bit, after you just heard us, this, I'm looking at the timer right now, now whether the editing makes this shorter. We've been talking for almost 40 minutes about how much we love each other. So if you're looking for a community like this, do it. Join it. Nicole, Even leave this in the final cup, please. Let I us, will. Let I us will. do a shameless plug for our group. <laughs> you need this. Join EOC now. Join EOC. It's free. It's free. It's free. It's free. Yeah. If you want people that will love you unconditionally, because we know that this generation struggles with anxiety, with a lot of mistreatment, um, a lot of anxiety and people feel left out and if you want to feel loved always this group of people and leaders will do exactly that because we are here with open arms and ready to hear your story god really moves through this yeah. and that is just amazing like this is Man, I, I feel like there's so, you can feel the prayers that are over us and that people have done. And so when you come into a group like this, you know that the support and love is coming from all sides. So apply to be loved. Apply <laughs> to be loved. You are loved already. Yes. Maybe you can edit that But for extra, <laughs> for extra love. For extra, extra. extra. Because the difference is this group, even though we're all so different, and we have made a click, also God is the center of this group. And he's the one that is guiding us and helping us. And I think that's also why it's so special, because we know why we are doing this. And we know that we're loved by us, each other, but also how God has loved this group unconditionally. Amen. Amen. I feel like that's a good spot to close. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Senai Spoyeni. Yokoso Bridges for Mission. Bienvenue Nan Pon Pu Mission. Welcome to Bridges for Mission. Welkom bij Brugge voor Zending. Welcome back to another episode of Bridges for Mission. My name is Minister Nicole Cox, and I am still here in Puerto Rico with the young adults. If you've listened to the episode before this, you would get to hear the amazing, let's get to talk about being in person as a whole ELC cohort for the first time. But in this episode, you are going to get to hear and explore with them what they have been up to during the service days of their Puerto Rico trip. So I'm here with the ELC, and so first I wanna hear what the indoor group got to do over the last three days. 
Alright, so we did a bunch of different stuff, but the first day we mostly did a lot of loads of laundry and a lot of cleaning floors in the office of the church where we're staying. And the second day we went and got some t-shirts for the VBS that was happening at the church. And then we went and picked up supplies for the stuff we did today. Mm -hmm. um, and today we packed backpacks for uh, school supplies and hygiene kits. 550 school supply bags and 250 hygiene packets. And the outdoor group? Uh, so the first day uh, we did, what's the word? <laughs> power washing. We did power washing um, the first day. Uh, so we power wa washed the roof of a church mer a member of the church um, and also one of their back rooms as well. So we did that sort of cleaning outside. Um, and then the second day we did uh, painting. So we painted the entire uh, inside uh, walls of another church member's house and we also did um, outside but just the backyard wall. So how has it been for you as a group of young adults to serve together whether indoor or outdoor? Um, so I think just being young younger people in mission work is something that's kind of unique to our age. You honestly don't see a ton of your peers rushing out to go do mission work. And I think something we've all talked about is um, having a hard time finding Christian communities in our homes because your only options are really the old ladies at church. There's not many people who are very public about their faith in our age bracket. And it's nice but it's also sad that we all live so many miles away from each other because we have a Christian community but it's not a Christian community we can sit down with and have Bible study in person every Sunday it's just not possible um, but it does give you hope that like you can find people from all over the world and seeing that we're all so dedicated to this mission and this cause that we would fly from multiple different countries and multiple places all over America that we would come together and give up a week of our summer, which is very precious for college kids, let me tell you. Um, for us to do that just shows our just genuine love and dedication to doing this, because it's not like it was an easy journey for any of us, like we all had to travel and make sacrifices to be here. Um, I want to add that it also like gives hope for the next generation like a lot of people just simply gave up on us. And so to feel like there's a group of youth that are showing their faith and that they're willing to help not each other, but people in need, I feel like it speaks a lot about our faith in God and how much we want to grow our, our relationship with him and with each other. I'm kind of going off of the difficulty finding community for me, it's not the absence of people, it's just the absence of safety, of containment, if you will. Um, there are a lot of people my age at my church, but when I tell them that I'm in medical school, they immediately don't know what to say to me. They just kind of shut down and are like, oh, cool, you're really smart. And for me, like, yes, I'm really smart, and that's how I define myself for a long time, but I don't anymore. And I want to talk to people about their experiences and learn about where they came from. And I feel like us all coming together, first of all, there was none of that to begin with. But then you put us all in this situation where we're hot and we're sweaty and we need to drink multiple things of both water and Gatorade and whatever else to stay hydrated throughout the day. And working hard out in the sun, doing something that we probably have never done in our lives or have only done on a few occasions, really brought us together and This was uh, really special for me because this is the first mission trip I've been on uh, since the pandemic. The last one I was on was in 2017 to Nicaragua. Um, and because of the, the pandemic, I was unable to go and serve um, abroad internationally. Um, and what's also different 
now versus then is then I was a teenager. I was still very, I haven't even graduated high school yet. I was still learning who I was and I still am learning who I am. Um, but as you know, a young person in their 20s uh, to meet other people in their 20s and you know, people like you know, also like about to exit high school um, has been just really, really amazing and profound. Um, and you know, to hear all of the amazing things that each of us are doing um, and the goals that we have is just really special. And you know, I'm super grateful that I get to now be a part of all these awesome people's lives and I get to hear about it, I get to see it um, and hopefully serve alongside these people for many, many, many years to come. I think also with what Nicole was saying, it's kind of like letting people just like, and Julian, like, many people just don't know, um, like, what to do with this generation, and they've just, they've given up on us, and like, at work, before I was leaving, like, so many people were like, oh, you're going to Puerto Rico, like, oh, that's so cool, and like, they're thinking, like, I'm going for vacation and whatever, but like, no, I'm going because I have this passion for missions, and so I'm, I was like trying to explain that to them, and so I'm super excited for when I can go back and I can tell them the stories of how we blessed um, so many people, um, because hopefully then they'll get to see um, that I wasn't just going to lay on the beach, but I was going um, because God is so good and He can do mighty things, and that there's it's more, there's more people than um, just us generation who is on our phones all the time and lazily walks into work. And so I'm really excited to like share with them. So hopefully that can ignite something in them too. So through these three days of service so far, has there been anything new that you've learned about yourself? I feel like my default has become caring for other people. Like that's my my gut instinct is like, whatever about me, if you had water, <laughs> what was the last time you put on sunscreen? And then somebody like turned around to me and but like, but what about you? I'm like, oh yeah, me. Um, <laughs> but that's a really good reminder that just like my default is caring for people, even though I don't always have opportunities to do so. So it's been really nice caring for you guys and with you guys. Yeah, it's pushed me outside of my comfort zone because I feel like too often like I get comfortable thinking about myself and like worrying if I've had enough to drink. But this experience and like getting to work with you guys has like helped me to like go outside of that and ask about you guys. How are you guys doing? Have you guys had enough water? Are you going to eat dinner? Are you going to eat breakfast? Um, and it's helped me to care about like you guys and step outside of myself. Yeah. I think it helped me to understand better that we need to. It, it, I, think over. <laughs> um, I think this experience has helped me to see how much we need to work together and how we can do a lot better and do more when we work together. Uh, for example, Adriana and I, uh, the first day we were doing a lot of um, like physical labor, it was hot outside, we are power washing, and we're tired and our arms hurt, and we would trade off, and I think usually I would be like, I just wanna push through and do it all by myself, but because we work together, we were able to accomplish a lot more than if we were to do it on. So how have you seen God at work while working with each other? Just like through conversations. Like while we're chat or while we're working, we're chatting. And I mean learning about these amazing people has just been such a blessing and I think someone earlier mentioned something similar to this, but um, 
just to see how God is at work in each of your lives has been such a blessing and I mean we've talked about how it's difficult to find community with peers that have like the same goals and the same desires to to serve and to grow with God and you can really see that and feel that and also like be with people like doing doing that you know like you're not just talking about oh I want to do this and that like you're actually doing it together and learning about how people want to continue doing this and how they want to continue doing this and that's um, just really awesome to see yeah God at work in, in your lives. See, I, I do see God, like, with you guys, but I also see him in circumstances. The first day, I showed you guys about this, uh, the first day, the washing machine was being very difficult. <laughs> and we finally gave up on that washing machine to go to the laundromat so we could do all of the loads of laundry we had to do in less time. Um, and that gave, me a, gave us an opportunity to really get to know the lady who's kind of in charge of the volunteers here. Um, she was the one who drove us over there. So we really got to know her and got to know a little bit about her story and what she does here and what this means to her. And we got to see how all of our help was helping her over the two days. Yeah, and I was in a different circumstance. I did one day on the outdoor team and one day on the indoor team. And on my day on the indoor team, I was also with the girls who were with the woman who runs missions at this church. And um, like she was telling us how they see teams in and out of here all the time and how like many people like want to volunteer and things. Um, and I asked her the question, how can we stay connected to you after we leave? Because I feel like one of the biggest issues with short-term missions is that people leave and never stop to think about the community they volunteered in ever again. And she actually told me that I was the first person to ever ask her that in all the years she's done mission and like worked with people here. And like that kind of just put things into perspective for me. Like this week for us was just this amazing like team bonding, wonderful experience. But we helped real people with real feelings and real lives. And it would be wrong of us to leave and never think about these people or this community ever again. And then I feel like like it's important that this team that we built here also transfers to home and that we continue to reach out to this community. And she said, even if you just email once a month and check in and say, hey, how are things going? They can say good or, oh, things aren't so great right now. We could use prayers or if you could do a fundraiser for us or something like that. Um, and then she was saying how it's also like a blessing for your team as well because if something happens to someone on our team, we can reach out and we have family here too. But to just make a connection with people, like. And that goes for us too, we've made a connection with ourselves. It, it would be wrong to just say, all right, see you guys next year. Like, no, like you should foster that community and that teamwork that we built and like did so much this week to foster. I don't believe that we, we our group, would walk away and be Oh, like, me neither, that that's it. generalization. <laughs> Dust off the pants, be like, all right, sweet, can go back to my comfortable, like middle-class dream life with a white picket fence. No, like, I do believe that this has been really transformative and informative for all of us. Um, and for me especially, it highlighted um, personal biases um, that I could not have addressed if I had not been vulnerable with team members and asked them questions about Puerto Rico's history and Puerto Rico's culture um, and just the, the, the entire zeitgeist uh, of the uh, Puerto Rican people um, and what they you know believe and I have much deeper respect and camaraderie with the people here because I was willing to address those biases um, and that is I think where I saw a lot of God's work is pushing me to ask those questions and to admit yeah I was wrong and that's okay Okay, so to wrap up this episode, I would like to ask the final question of, if you could describe your three days of service in one word, what would that one word be? One word? Yep. Everybody's gotta say something. Come on now, guys. Can 
Can I do three? No. <laughs> <laughs> One. One. No. Very fun. No. <laughs> that was actually three because he said um first. <laughs> Um, well, it was really cool and fun, and I really liked it. That's a lot more than <laughs> one, one will. I feel like as a team, if we each choose one word, we will capture the experience and do it justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Better so together, right? Uh, I'd say friendship. Emotion. Support. <laughs> Chaos. Listeners, there you have it. That is what these young adults have been up to over the last three days serving in the local community in Puerto Rico with their passion for the service itself and the passion for each other. So I hope that you enjoyed listening to this episode and getting a little more of a glimpse into what took place this week. And I hope that you liked all of their words and that collectively it gives you a beautiful picture of what we have been able to see in person. So until next time. Adios! Bienvenue au Pont pour la Mission. Welcome to Bridges for Mission. Bienvenido al Punte a Misión. Juanin, Juanin, this is Bridges for Mission. Bienvenido na Pont pour Misión. Tu lo muba na su da fa kukaso a do de pa. Welcome to another episode of B4M. My name is Nicole Cox and I will be overseeing the episode today because I have a very special treat for you. In the end of April to the beginning of May, I had the honor to lead a group of five to Japan to go and serve alongside Leanne and Gordon Huang in Rifu, Japan. So in this episode, it will be very different than what you are normally hear from us. We will not be asking a ton of questions because these clips that you're about to hear are live recordings the day of the event. So you may hear some people asking some questions um, and then other times you'll just hear people come on and speak about an experience that we had that day. So you will be hearing mainly from three of the team members. Um, one is name is Trey, the second is Regan, and the third is Sandra. So we hope that you enjoy the sneak peek into our short-term mission trip into Japan. Among the cultural experiences that we will have here in Japan, one of the first ones that we are getting to experience is the ramen fest. So Regan, how did you like the ramen? So after you get your ticket, you go into the line of the ramen that you want, and they have this very organized layout to save space efficiently with cones and lines to zigzag the line and then after you give them your ticket they would send you to another line to pick up your ramen um, everything was very efficient and, and um, diligent in how they use their time and space and as I got to the front of the line I noticed that um, you know they were asking questions uh, the customer would pay a little bit more money like a couple more coins so I was like oh what are they doing I thought we already paid at the vending machine and apparently they were paying for paying more money if they wanted extra toppings. And so 
here I kind of started to freak out and I didn't really know what to do, but I just started observing them and trying to see what they were doing. Um, and that's when I figured out that, oh, they were trying to buy toppings. And so um, I eventually figured out, got my toppings, went to the other line to wait for my ramen. And um, I eventually got my ramen. Um, and of course it was really delicious. I got a pork broth ramen. Um, point being that uh, throughout this festival, not only did I get to eat really good ramen from around the world, but um, just simply how Japan is efficient and all that they do, even from the vending machine line all the way to um, how they set up their lines uh, was really cool to see and um, just how different their culture is from American culture. So today we stopped at a normal Japanese custom known as an onsen, which is a naturally hot spring, which is outside, and their public baths. So we would, so we went and we washed ourselves completely, got ourselves nice and clean, and we went and sat in these really hot springs and it was one of the more relaxing things that I've ever done. They had four levels, all with different temperatures. And you can, you could see the steam coming off of the water. And you could feel like the natural springs just pouring in. It was a very, very nice experience. Very nice. It was, since it was also outside, you could see the trees, and you can see flowers, and you can see this is the moon, the skylight, and the skyline. It, yeah, it was very nice. The first night, it was actually a little rainy, so you could feel cold raindrops hitting you on your face while you're in the hot water, and it was so nice. It felt so nice. It was really great. So I'm here with Trey, and this morning we went to the Nozomi Project. So Trey, tell us a little bit about the Nozomi Project and what we did. So while we were at the Nozomi Project, we learned all about their story and how impactful their work has been. Honestly, it was something, some of the most impactful things I've heard. They actually put their shop right in the heart of where the tsunami hit Japan. And they've been there for over 10 years now. They've been making jewelry out of the broken pottery that they find from events such as the, the tsunami or anything else. And it's just so inspirational to see how far they've been able to go and how long they've been able to go. Because like, it's just, that's just wow to me. Um, their slogan is beauty and brokenness. And I feel like that's just so representative of what the community needed to see especially after the tsunami hit i'm sure that a lot there's a lot of people that were like really down and they didn't understand what was going on and they didn't know they didn't know where their next meal was going to come from honestly but there were still people who were able to find the beauty in the broken broken pieces of pottery and they're able to make them into the most stunning pieces that i've seen so it's been, it was a really, really nice experience. Oh, the Nozomi Project. I have to admit, I really bought more than I should and don't tell anybody, but they're all for me. <laughs> so um, as for the Nozomi Project, that was a very, very fun experience to hear how the concept of the jewelry was being made. Um, I've made jewelry for years and I use oddball things and create, create jewelry too. But, um, to see that the quality of their pieces and the quantity of the amount of 
china and pottery that they've found or have been given and donated from other earthquakes from japan um is just astounding to me <clears throat> the sakura pieces with all the cherry blossoms really hit hard to me because that's my family name from my husband and so i had to have a piece of that the women, the women that were trying to provide for their families during this time of trauma, how they picked themselves up and created this beautiful artwork. I commend them and continue to this day. The parents can work on their own schedule and everybody is a family in the middle of this devastated area. Um, it was just, it was very, um, I was very excited to see where this project goes and where it takes us. Beans at the, at our church, the Japanese Baptist church in Seattle. Um, I've seen some pieces from their earlier stuff and their quality has gone up tremendously since the earlier stuff. Um, so they'd learn as they're going and it's just amazing to me hey trey you're out here on this beautiful island in japan how are you feeling it's one of the more beautiful things i've ever seen um, the air is very crisp the water is very relaxing serene i think that's a good word i think that's a good feeling you know, I think it would be like, it would be really cool to go like visit these islands, but like, this is really what I was trying to see when I came, when I wanted to come to Japan, something like this whole type of landscape. So now I feel, I feel complete. Very beautiful. So I'm here with Regan. And him and Nicole actually just met with the mayor of Rifu. Regan, can you tell us about this experience that you just had? Um, it was actually a huge honor. Uh, just knowing how much time he was taking out of his day to get to know us better, asking us where we were, and etc. cetera. Uh, I'm sure that's a formality thing of how most conversations go in Japan, but I felt like it was still a huge honor. Uh, he seemed very professional about it and very charismatic. It was like his his voice wasn't monotone, but more controlled and professional. Um, and he was a very likable guy. And you could tell he was really uh, a good mayor that's interested in what the people want and um, for the well-being of the people. Later, he led us into his tea room and performed a tea ceremony for us. And here, I felt super honored. I felt so very, I felt very special as if I felt very special since I know that he probably doesn't perform this for just anyone. It honestly reminded me of how God, the God of Most High, spends time to get to know us individually, patiently, and not in any rush. It made me experience the depth of God's love more and understand that in a new way. And that's kind of how I felt when the mayor was doing the tea ceremony for me, Nicole, and um, Leanne and Gordon or the two missionaries that were with us. Um, so it was a really good experience and I definitely also got to experience the business culture of Japan and where they exchange business cards um, mm -hmm. with everyone there. And that was really cool to see firsthand. And I think it was just a really good experience to meet someone in uh, the Japanese government system. Definitely. Tea ceremonies are a very big honor. Nicole, how did you feel about meeting the mayor of um, Honestly, the tea ceremony for me was the highlight of the visit because of that. Um, because of the, the process of, of him to learn the tea ceremony and then to take that extra time um, after we met and talked with him to do that for us was it, was, it was major. I mean, we were complete strangers to him. 
And after meeting with us, he, you know, he said, come to my secret room. And it was for the tea ceremony. And it was absolutely beautiful. And just the, the manner and the humbleness of him serving tea to complete strangers um, was just beautiful and breathtaking. And at the end, Gordon asked, how can we pray for you? And he said, no, 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 don't pray for me. Pray for my people. Mm. Pray that we have what, you know, that I can give them what they need and um, we can f find resources and we can do this and we can do that. And just the automatic response of, no, don't pray for me, pray for my people. There was no hesitation for him to say, pray for my people instead of me. So it was just a beautiful time spent with him and Leanne and Gordon and Regan um, and just to have that opportunity while in Japan was amazing. It's interesting that you say that he had that humbleness about himself. That made me think of Galatians 5, verse 14. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So it sounds like he's more with the amount of... I feel like that can show you how much love he has, not only for himself, but for his people. Because if you're able to put people before yourself it shows that selflessness and not selfishness mm -hmm. which I believe is very important for someone that's in such a high position mm -hmm. and it still takes so much love to put them before you and to love them so much that you would say no it's not about me it's about them that's what Christ tells us to do amen so today we went to the 311 Museum. It's commemorated for all the lives that were lost during the tsunami that happened in 2011. And it was a very powerful experience. I would say it was the most profound thing that we've seen in Japan, that I've seen in Japan. While we were there, we were able to see a, a video about how powerful the tsunami actually was and the, the terror that it caused. And we learned about a man whose wife went back to save their dog because she believed that she still had time to make it home and back to where they were in one piece. And she didn't tell her husband that she was going to leave. She just kind of left and she didn't make it back. And we can see, you could see on his face how hard it was for him to process everything and how to how he has to just be strong and live live for her now. But it was a very very powerful experience. The waters were able to reach three point seven meters, which is about twelve and a half feet, and that's on the lowest end of the tsunami. That was the lower end. The higher end, it was about 10 meters when it was actually rolling into the city. And it was just, it was a lot, to be honest. It was a lot. It's good because you're able to appreciate more what you have and understand that it is still something that it's a blessing that it's not something that we have to deal with. And it's not like a constant worry in the back of our mind in America. While we have other natural disasters, seeing the devastation was, um, you know, you hear about them and I've lived through one, but most people haven't. So yeah, it was a very powerful experience to see that the museum, very powerful. So I'm here with Nicole, um, and we just had our arigato party, and some of the women in our group had a had the privilege of dressing up in kimonos. So Nicole, how was that experience? 
Yeah, it was a little frightening at first when they called us forward saying that uh, myself, Sandra, and Sarah McCloy, who's the new Endoice Global Servant for Japan, um, she was there with the party with us, and they called us forward saying that they were going to dress us in traditional kimonos. So a young adult that we had the honor to have dinner with last night um, brought her kimono collection and let us pick out the color combination that we wanted to wear and her and two other women and the group um, dressed the three of us and it was something to um, behold and to take part in because it's just a, a very long process um, and just the the pride and the honor that they take in making sure that all the creases are correct and all the folds are right and that it's tied properly and the whole process was just really beautiful to, to see and to, to be a part of. But I was a little nervous walking around in them um, because I know how precious they are to the owner. So there was a lot of food and there's a lot of people. So I was a little worried about getting something on it. But thankfully, I did not. Um, everything was good. But it was just so good to have her gift that experience to us, um, to be able to dress us in her kimono set and to be so proud to watch us walk around for the rest of the evening wearing it. And we all looked very beautiful and they were surprisingly very comfortable. So it was, it was a good time. I think one of the most special moments that I had while we were there was at the Sayonara party. One of the gals that doesn't speak any English was talked into going to the mall the day before with the younger kids so they could watch and go look at anime stuff. Um, and that Sunday she dressed in the most beautiful kimono at church service. That was during the baptism. Um, but she just looked so beautiful and come to find out that afternoon at the Sayonara party that she was going to bring her collection of her personal kimonos and she wanted to dress us because over there you don't dress yourself in your kimono you let the ladies dress you and so we got to pick out um, kimonos out of her collection and she dressed each one of us she got Sarah Nicole and myself and it was fun just to be pampered a little bit after being there for so long and and working for everybody else. It was just kind of nice to be, you know, celebrated, I guess you'd say. Um, but the cheers that we got when we came out, I mean, she was just an amazing young lady. Um, that was just a very special moment for me. Uh, the rest of the Sayonara party was just off the hook, <laughs> as the young kids would say. There was so much food and so many people. We, it, They were autographing fans for us in their names, Kanji, and some of them would tell us what they mean. And it was, they were coming to us and saying, I want to give my name on your fan, you know. It's like, okay, well, here you go. But we were getting dressed in our kimonos so we didn't understand what was going on because we came out and that's what everybody was doing so um yeah it was just kind of fun because I mean the little kids had come up to us at that point and you know they wanted to express their thank yous for us being there and that was their send-off to us so it was it was really special so what did you think do you think you might want to go to Japan and serve on a short-term mission trip? Well, I hope these cultural immersion experiences that you've just listened to piques interest and the possibility. Stay tuned for part two, where we will talk a little more about what we actually did, the service projects and the work that we were able to do while serving. So be sure to tune in to part two. So we thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to our trip to Japan. Until next time.
Bienvenue au Pont pour la Mission. Welcome to Bridges for Mission. Bienvenido au Ponte à Mission. Huaning, huaning. This is Bridges for Mission. Bienvenue na Pont pour Mission. Welcome back for another episode of B4M. My name is Nicole Cox, and this is part two of the short-term mission trip to Japan. So in the first episode, you got to hear some of the cultural immersion experiences that myself and the team were able to take part in. In this episode, you will get to hear more of the work that we were able to do from family camp to work day to lunch and meals with the local community and so much more. And at the end, there's actually a question that Gordon Wong, the global servant in the area, posed to our team that we answered on our final night together um, when we shared a meal at a local restaurant. So we hope you enjoy hearing about our stories of service in Japan. So in this section, we're going to talk a little bit about the work day and some of the work that we've done here at Argos Camp. Regan, what's some of the work that you have done? Yeah, so today specifically, uh, we uh, worked on cleaning the Shalom House, which is a place, which is a cabin where people can stay um, for either spiritual camps or even just economic income. Uh, Yeah, so at first I didn't really want to clean just because my first assignment was to clean the windows and each there's seven set of windows and there are double doors and both doors have windows and each set has two sets of double doors and then you have to do the outside and the inside. So one set, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight sides that you have to clean and they're all about like a door size, maybe a little bigger. Um, and so it's pretty hard to get these spotless so it's pretty hard and on the body and mentally. Um, but I think later what made the day better was that I got to clean with two of the Japanese kids. Um, and with my subpar Japanese, we were able to somewhat communicate of what I needed, where we needed to spray, where we needed to clean. Of course, I would get the taller places and they would get the lower ones. Um, although it was still pretty hard work and made it a lot more enjoyable. And later the kids started yelling, Rigan, Rigan, and I would, which is my name in, in, in Japanese characters. And so despite the language barriers with these kids, I was ma- able to make this bond or connection. Um, we were able to teach each other English and Japanese words, such as like fire or hono in Japanese or water bottle or suito. Um, and later all of the kids, uh, the younger and older kids started timing our laps around the house and I felt like I was in the inn. Um, so not only was this a really good bonding experience with the Japanese community um, for encouragement, but also a time to serve um, and help donate my time and energy to clean um, this building used for their ministry. One of the things that we were also able to do while we have been here is to paint their church here on the campground. And it was a project from a distance that we thought maybe would only take a couple of hours. Uh, but once we got the, the paint um, and really started painting on the wood, we realized it was going to take a lot longer. The wood was very dry and the paint was very thin. It was more of a, um, a stain than it was a paint. So we ended up having to do three coats on this entire building. And while that was a day and a half worth of work, it actually turned out to be a lot of fun because I got to teach Regan and Trey how to paint because they had never done exterior painting um, before. And so that was a lot of fun watching them do trial and error with uh, Japanese paint brushes, which is also a little different than American paint brushes. Um, so it was quite entertaining to see them do that. We were able to get into some good conversation and share some laughs and just make the day, you know, that much more enjoyable while working in the sun. But to be able to 
team bond and to laugh and tell stories and um, really just get to know one another. So it was a lot of fun to, to paint the church. And it's also been such a joy to see people um, that actually attend the church to come and to see it painted, um, just to see the happiness and the joy that they have to see their beloved church uh, with a new coat of paint. Um, it's just, it's really good to see that on their faces. So Trey, can you tell us a little bit about some of the work that you've done here while on the campground? Sure. It's been more muscle, less mental, I would say. We've had pretty good coordinators and they've helped us with all the behind the scenes stuff. And it's really, that really helps me because I've really shown up and I've just been able to move stuff, pick stuff up, take stuff where it needs to be, and then just kind of be myself. First, we were staining the Oasis Chapel. The wood on it had gotten pretty old and dingy, so we had to, you know, make it look a little better. My back may not have liked it at first, but I, you know, at the end of the day, we didn't come here for play, we came here to work. So having that mindset really helped me power through and understand that this work isn't just for me. It isn't about me at all, honestly. It's about the it's about their it's about the community. It's about giving to someone else. I'll never I might not ever see that chapel again. But there's gonna be people who will be in that chapel every week. And they'll remember the good work that we were able to do. And that's what really helped me like stay motivated because was that some work? <laughs> we had to do two, we did two coats in a day, one coat in a, two coats in a day, I believe. And then that didn't take very well. So then we went back and did another coat and that took kind of well. And then I don't think we did another coat, but we still had to let it all dry and pray that it would end up looking good because the wood, as I said, was so old and dingy, it didn't want to cooperate with us. Uh, yeah, good times, very good times. Now the chapel looks beautiful. I hope we're able to upload some pictures so you can see the before and after. And I would say this is, it was not easy work, but it definitely was work that I will remember as rewarding and the feeling of tired is like a good tired it's like you earned it's like you earned your you earned your tired which I'm never mad at so I'm here with Trey and it is family day here on the camp so Trey what was a highlight from today so I would say a highlight that I had today was a conversation that I had with one of um one of the one of the people that came he's actually him and his family are moved to Sendai about a month ago and they've been searching around looking for churches and pastor extended the invitation for them to come to family day today and he he brought his family so I was talking to him about his journey and how he went from school to going to all over the world pretty much and how he still landed back in Japan and it was just really impactful to hear how his experience brought him closer to Christ and yeah, he was able to bring his family along with that experience as well um, and I was also able to share my experience and what was able to what I'm able to bring I feel and what well what I feel God has given me to serve as well and I can just see like the instant connection between us it's it was kind of unexpected I would say because I didn't think there would be like an immediate like understanding but there was he was able to understand the passion that I have and I was able to understand the passion that he has and I think that's kind of what it's all about. I think that's the power of scripture. That's the power of the gospel. Once you find someone that believes 
when you find another person that believes, you're able to kind of coincide with one another. So that definitely say that was a highlight because that's something I'm always going to remember. So I'm here with Regan and we just wrapped up family camp. Regan, do you mind telling us a little bit about what family camp is and then how you experienced it? Yeah, so family camp is just an event for the church community, uh, for the whole family to be invited to eat some food um, and just to be out camping all day, um, even though we didn't camp in tent tents or anything. So as a team, we prepared American foods such as skewers, raw veggies, instant mac and cheese, and instant mashed potatoes, um, and some other um, food items. The Japanese people served barbecue, yakisoba, or fried noodles, um, octopus, and other stuff as well. And I got to talk to a lot of people such as the pastor, um, pastor's dad, um, and a couple of other people. Um, and it was really nice. I think um, from the conversations, I learned a lot about that event in itself and why they had that event in the first place. Um, one of the people said it's an event that they don't normally have. Um, and because usually the events that they do have are programmed, um, but with a program with a set schedule, there comes some sort of expectation or obligation to act or do a certain thing but this event was geared to um have everyone be relaxed and the vision was that uh, the leaders would be able to do what free up the leaders from obligations or anything that they have um so that they could talk to like the church members or newcomers if there were any um so i thought that was really insightful and and definitely gave me more knowledge on what japanese culture is like and um, the expectations uh, that come with certain events family day was so fun just to see the excitement in everybody's face when we brought out some of the foods that we had to offer we did um chocolate cake and strawberries on skewers and then drizzled it in white chocolate. So that was our strawberry shortcakes. And then we did little miniature hamburgers or cheeseburgers on a skewer where we had like a half a meatball and then cheese and bacon and lettuce and a chunk of tomato. And they were on little skewers. So those two were big hits. Everybody loved those. Uh, what else did we do for family day? Oh, I did a sushi class. Yeah, think about it. Teaching Japanese people how to make sushi. Well, I did. I used fruit leather instead of seaweed. I used, or I should say fruit roll-ups because that's what they call them nowadays. Back in my days, it was fruit leather, but fruit roll-ups for the seaweed. Salted caramel rice crispy treats for the rice. And then we had licorice and um, gummy worms and, and just all sorts of different candies that they could put in. And so I taught a couple of classes during family day, had them all come inside, and it was fun to see them make it. They were all just like, this is not sushi. I said, well, it's Rice Krispies, so it's kind of rice. It's, you know, sushi is with rice. So, but it was fun to see what creations they were creating and they looked so beautiful um they were just they were so pretty and colorful and and just everybody really had fun doing it and they never would have done that on their own so to bring something weird and exciting to these people and most of them were adults young adults and and i even got pastor's uh, mom in there to make one so that was kind of fun but um it, it was it was just neat to see the smiles on their faces. And then, of course, one of the gals gave a piece of sushi to her mother and didn't bother to tell her what it was. She thought it was a piece of sushi. So she sticks it in her mouth and her mother just immediately went, what? <laughs> in Japanese, facial expression. I know you can't see that on the podcast, but... It was funny, the, the um, reaction that she got on, on camera for 
that was, it, it was quite funny. And then she came in and made some. So it was, it was, it was really a lot of fun. I expected to have the little kids in there and I had, I think one of the little kids got in there, but, um, the littler kids were kind of more shy of us, I think. Um, but we warmed up to them, I think by the end. Hi, Nicole. Hello. So what are you doing, Gordon? Oh, we're grilling um, burgers for dinner tonight. Is this the famous Gordon barbecue grilling that I've heard so much about? Well, I don't know if it's the one that you've heard about, but this is what we're doing uh, this evening <laughs> on, on our uh, Weber grill. <laughs> and we're having um, about um, 12 guests. Um, so we're cooking dinner for the workers who helped out and cleaning up the Shalom House, which is the dormitory at Morigo Camp. Wonderful. What's your favorite part about cooking for, for guests? Uh, I get inspired when I get to serve. And so these hamburgers are going to be a little bit special as we um, found some special hamburger buns locally. Um, so we're happy to serve. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks very much. God bless. Before we even went to Japan, Leanne had asked me to come up with some um, American me menus. And so I brought some great American recipes, uh, knowing that she knew that I was into catering and I've done a lot of restaurant food work and caterings and all sorts of stuff. But so I brought a bunch of menus and recipes and things. However, I had to change most of them on the fly because the kinds of things that we could get there are not the same kinds of things that we can get here and not in the quantity that we need. Like I expect to be able to get a Costco sized tub of cherry tomatoes and they sell them in like little containers of six or seven. And so the price difference is quite a bit because you're looking at like 15 little tiny containers and then you've got all that waste. Um, it, it's just odd to me how, how that, and that's celery. Here you can buy a whole head of celery. There it's you buy it by the stock <laughs> and they're individually wrapped, one or two stocks to a package. It's just, just bog, mind boggling to me um, how they can create <laughs> anything over there. But in the Japanese culture, they do meals in little dabs of stuff. Like they'll have like five to seven um, little dishes on their tray and each one of them has just a, a bite or two of each different thing. That's how they've always been. So to have me come in and try to do potato salad and hamburgers and chicken salad and, and doing that kind of stuff and trying to come up with a menu after we've already been there trying to figure out, you know, what we can get. And we only had one Costco run and I knew this stuff wasn't going to last throughout the whole nine days. So we had to think about what we could do at the grocery stores at the mall. <laughs> um, it's, it's a different mentality on trying to cook American food in Japan, put it that way. Um, but we did it. Uh, Sam was excellent in the kitchen. He kept cleaning stuff and keeping it clean for us and giving us new cutting boards. And as, as we're all sitting there chopping stuff, um, he was a trooper. How has it been for you helping, um, cook and do all the meals? We had a great time or I had a great time because we had great food and I, I, and being, knowing how food and washing dishes are i really enjoy it because when that happens and all the dishes i see all the dishes oh look at that look at that and and it makes me feel real real happy because people are enjoying my cooking or the cooking that's with me it's nice and i think it's a way to not look at uh look at food or somebody doing the food or or that as a chore because it's just really nice and comfortable and and just if you keep it that way i think and 
it'll be really strong and helpful and that's the way it I'm closing out the weeks now and I'm doing dishes and I have loved what I have done and other people around me and how they uh, were all one part of a cohesive great team and, and people and I would uh, love you to do that again. <laughs> The women's lunch was so fun. It was nine ladies sitting down at a table and enjoying food. We made um, some American potato salad and, and chicken salad sandwiches and things like that for them. And then I made a special panna cotta dessert with some berries on top. And they love them. <laughs> so these Japanese women don't get to have Americanized food very often. So I was asked to create a nice little American finger lunch for them. Um, so it was fun. But not only was feeding them something that they normally have exciting, but to see the appreciation in their hearts, we were gifted these wonderful pine cones that one of the ladies made. She took regular pine cones and then she took pieces of kimono and made little rose petals and sewed the rose petals onto the pine cones and gifted these to us. Um, it'll be a nice little Christmas tree ornament or I can put some some smelly oils on the on the um, pine cone and have a little air freshener there's so many different ways you can use this but it's just beautiful um, the talent of work that these ladies are she's also a painter so of course I connected with painting rocks because I do that back in the states um, back home <laughs> I paint rocks and I leave them around for people to find them and it just brings happiness it brings smiles and her art she paints rocks but then she glues them onto other things and uses these um, it looks like a, a shale or a slate kind of a rock they're flat and and um, she paints abstract art on them and then she glues them onto pictures and it just makes it beautiful she won an award for one that recently that she's done uh, so the conversations started going and, and they were talking about the kimonos and of course I had to show my wedding dress which was a kimono and I said you can't cut this one up and of course the translators because these three ladies didn't know any English but we still communicated um, through the art I think and the um, when I showed them the picture of the kimono one of the other ladies, her eyes just lit up and I'm not exactly sure all of the conversation that happened between the translators and her because they weren't translating to us very much. But at the end of the conversation, come to find out, she wanted to gift me one of her um, authentic original kimonos that she has in her collection. Apparently she has over 30 kimonos in her collection um, I could only hope to be you know, in my 90s and have 30 beautiful kimonos <clears throat> but by the end of the lunch she had decided that she wanted to gift half of the kimonos to Leanne and us so we each got to take a kimono home and it, it was very very cool that you know even the guys got to take a kimono home with them um, to gift to someone special in their lives so yeah it had the obis and the and the ties and everything um, so it was kind of fun and special after you've uh, had a few moments to think about it is there any um, thing that God has shown you on this trip so in a few words this trip has really been a rewarding experience. It's brought meaning to the language barrier between cultures. 
and it's allowed me to see more into Sam's heritage and culture. But most of all, it's just been rewarding apart from seeing the little kids to the older people all be so excited that we were here to help them. I would say I've learned, well, I was shown a lot of things. I think the most powerful thing is that no matter where you go, the faith in Christ is always, whatever you find believers and their faith in Christ is strong. No matter how big or small the community is, you can see the power and like the unity within them. We have people from all over the United States we've never met before. We've talked on Zoom calls, but we've never met face to face and we can still feel like a family. We have a, we're at a church where they are still recovering from COVID and their membership is fluctuating sometimes and they still feel unified. They still feel like a family and they're extending that right hand, right hand of fellowship to us, people they have never met before. It just shows you how powerful the blood really is. I'd say one of the things that is a humble reminder during this week is that uh, we come in partnership, that we don't come to serve over anyone, but we come to serve alongside. And just those honors that we've received through the tea ceremony with the mayor, um, just the way that people are so gracious when we interact with them and work with them, that it, it truly is a partnership. And that is what matters more than coming in and assuming that we are going to teach them things, but that bridge of we're both learning with each other. Uh, I think for me, it helps me appreciate a lot of the culture, language, and the people more. Um, and I think it also helped me to see uh, what my future could look like, but also like what skills, how much lack of skill that I have. Um, like I don't have amazing catering skills or um, or like even language skills, it's still pretty amateur. But I think that's helping me set up like what I need to do now for, I don't know, any possible future of like missions or uh, yeah, anything. Like kind of what I need to work on so I can be more effective in the future. We thank you for listening to part two of our short-term mission trip to Japan. And we hope that hearing the service projects and the service opportunities we had gave you a little more insight to our 10 days with the Huangs in Japan. So if you're interested in going on a short-term mission trip, whether it's to Japan or anywhere, please do not hesitate to reach out to the short-term mission desk here at International Ministries using the email volunteers at internationalministries.org. We hope to hear from you and thanks for listening. Until next time.